What's up guys, I'm Brad from Fix This Build That and today we're gonna make ingrain cutting boards with some unique designs and these cool integrated hand holes that'll really set your boards apart. Stay tuned, I'll show you just how I did it. Ingrain cutting board designs aren't hard to make, you just gotta plan a little beforehand and it all starts with material selection. And when I have off cuts from other projects, I cut them down to use as blanks for cutting boards. I grabbed three sets of blanks from the rack with different grain patterns and took them over to the bench. Now these first boards have the grain lines running straight across the end grain. Now not a lot going on here and these wouldn't look that great or interesting in an end grain board. This next set's what you're looking for for more interesting designs. The grain runs diagonal across the end so you can rearrange the boards and have them form a V or an arrow shape like you see here. The last set is walnut with some sap wood showing on the corners. That's the lighter wood here. Now this is the gold mine. The lighter sapwood really stands out against the dark heartwood. And after cutting and rearranging, we can make that light wood turn into the diamond shapes or other cool designs. I took two blanks from the last set to make the diamonds and then I filled in the rest of the board from the second set that I had. And this looked like a good setup to me, so I marked the ends with a letter to recreate this after prepping them for glue up. Now if you want to buy lumber for this instead of using offcuts, you'll look for a small slab or a wide board with diagonal sapwood on the edges of the board. I had this small slab with a chainsaw mark in the edge so I couldn't really use it for a live edge piece anymore, but it'll be perfect to recreate this diamond pattern. Now the slab was too wide to flatten in one piece, so I ripped it down the center with a track saw and I flattened each side in the planer. And as I removed the rough wood, I could really start seeing the grain in the board shining through. I looked down the edge of each piece and it was a bit wavy so I tried to find where I could make the cut to keep that diamond shape coming to a point along the edge of the sapwood. After I found the best position, I marked the cut line on the edge of each of the boards with a pencil. I used this mark to line up the track saw and I ripped off the live edge I didn't need anymore. And this could also be done on the table saw with a straight line cutting jig. Now that I had all the boards prepped, I took the original offcut blanks and the slabs to my joiner to flatten the edges for the glue up. Now this part could also be done on the table saw with a straight line cutting jig if you don't have a joiner. Now with one straight edge on the offcuts, I set the table saw fence to just under the width of the narrowest of the boards. Then I ran them all through at this setting to get the boards the same width with two flat sides ready for the glue up. I rearranged the boards using the letters that I'd put on the ends earlier and I laid them on my parallel clamps for that first glue up. Now when you're applying the glue, you want enough that it has a nice squeeze out, but you don't want to overdo it either and just make a huge mess. All right, I've got the slab board ready for a glue up. I am not sure how this is gonna turn out because this sap line right here kind of goes in and out. So these diamonds might not look great at all. Let's glue it up and find out. Now this slab glue up is way easier since it's just one joint, which is another benefit to using wide boards for your project. When the glue was dry, I tried the old Jackman clamp removal method, and it really works. I felt like I was on a roll, so I tried out the old magic mallet trick too, and that worked also. I mean, removing clamps by hand is so last year. The next up, I ran the boards through my planer again to get flat parallel surfaces. These faces that I'm planning will be my glue surface for the next glue up, so getting them smooth is really important. But don't overdo it here either. You want the boards as thick as you can keep them, which you'll see why in a minute. Now here's the tricky part, figuring out how wide to cut the strips for this next glue up. But it's not bad once you get the process down, so just hang in there with me, warning, math ahead. So first measure the thickness and the shortest length of your glue up, and next you'll decide how many strips to cut. And it takes two strips to make one diamond, so this will always be an even number if you're trying to do that pattern. The length of the final cutting board will be the number of the strips times the thickness of them. So for this board, if I had 10 strips at 13 16 of an inch, that would make an 8.125 or 8 and an eighth of an inch long board. But if I go up to 16 strips, the final length is going to be 13 inches. I decided on 14 strips for my board, and this is going to make my board about 8.5 by 11 inches. And now that we know how many strips that we need to cut, we need to figure out how wide each of them should be. And that's also going to determine how thick the final cutting board is. Then just take the length of the initial glue up and divide it by the number of strips that you want. But we also have to account in the kerf or the thickness of that table saw blade that we're using. I'm using a 3 seconds of an inch thin kerf blade to save on material, so that puts each strip at just over one inch, which is a good thickness for the final cutting board, so I was pretty happy with that. 
And if you're digging what you're seeing so far, go ahead and get subscribed. We can have some more crazy fun with math. Or maybe do some woodworking and DIY projects. Now using a crosscut sled on my table saw, I cut a straight edge on the blank, trying to just skim that shortest part of the board. Then I set a stop block on my sled to make those one inch wide cuts for the strips. I made all the cuts and I used a pencil to hold the wood down as I got close to the end to keep my hand away from the blade. But I'd highly recommend a wooden hold down here attached to the sled for more safety and keep your hands fully away from the blade. After I was done, I had all my 14, ugh, nope, 13 pieces and a piece just too small for the last cut. When I checked the width of this strip, I realized that I had gone just over an inch and across 13 cuts, it added up enough to throw me off so I couldn't make that final 14th one. So err on the underside here when you're setting up your stop block. I did the same mental math gymnastics for the slab board and I ended up cutting all of those strips to one and three eighths of an inch wide. With all the pieces ready, I took the strips from the offcut board over to the bench and I flipped each piece the opposite direction of the one next to it to reveal exactly what I was hoping for, this very cool diamond pattern. Now from here, you can just go straight into that final glue up. Just keep the center line of the diamonds aligned as best you can here. The glue is going to be slippery, so take your time and use some scraps to help you line everything up and keep it in order. Next, I grabbed the slab board strips, and I quickly realized it was just like I'd feared. The light sapwood on one side was much darker than the other, so that the diamond pattern was kind of a bust. So instead, I tried a few other orientations, and I ended on this kind of bow tie pattern, leaving off the last six strips. Now, the lesson here is you can make all kinds of different designs with the same pieces. Just keep alternating and flipping them in groups of ones or twos until you find that design that you want. Now glue up went the same way except that I flipped the strips end for end and my center line wasn't actually centered so I ended up with a little bit of a jagged edge here but I can easily clean that up on the table saw later. After about an hour in the clamp up I came back and I scraped off the glue beads from the boards to make the sanding stage a little bit easier. The next day when the glue was fully dried I pulled the boards out and I scraped off as much of the leftover dried glue as I could using a putty knife and then a card scraper. Now to flatten the boards to final size, I took them over to my 1836 drum sander from Jet, the sponsor of today's video. Now I've been using Jet tools in my shop for several years now and this drum sander along with my Jet two horsepower cyclone dust collector make an awesome pair. The sander makes short work of the tedious job of sanding end grain and there's no chance of tear out or the potential dangers of putting an end grain board through a planer. You really don't wanna do that. I'll have links to the drum sander and all the other jet tools that I use today down in the description. You can go ahead and check them out. Now with the boards flat, I took them back over to the table saw and I used the crosscut sled to square up each side of the board. Now at this point, you can add your edge profiles and handles before getting into final sanding. And I like the look of an integrated handhold on a board, so I pulled out my jet router table to put them on this thicker board. I'm using a three quarter of an inch flat bottom bowl bit, which I raised up about a quarter of an inch above the table. I used one of those extra strips of the slab board for the setup. I moved the fence until it was centered right on the edge of that strip. To set the distance of the handhold, I marked two inches in from each end of that setup strip. And then I lined up the mark on the outside of the bit and set the fence flip stop to define one end. For the other end, I used the setup board to transfer a mark onto the fence where I want my other stop block. Next, I set up the feather board on the table to keep the board tight against the fence during the cut and I clamped a scrap with a 45 degree miter on it at that starting point that I had marked earlier. So to make the cut, I register the corner of the board against that miter block, then I can just pivot it down onto the bit, and when that bit is fully buried, I run it across until I hit the other stop block and pull the board away. Now this makes a safe way to keep the board under control and get a nice handhold routed on each end. I pulled out my downdraft sanding table for these next few steps. At first, I routed a 1 16th of an inch roundover around all the edges of each board. Then I broke the edges of the handhold by hand sanding them as well as smoothing out all the other corners. After that, I went through the sanding progression going from 80 to 120 to 180 grit. Between 180 and 220, I wet the board down with water to raise the grain. If you don't do this, the board can feel fuzzy after the first time you wash it. After it dried, I used 220 grit and I hand sanded with 320 grit for an ultra smooth finish. Now to finish the boards, I seasoned them with pure mineral oil. 
Ingrain boards soak up oil much more than long grain boards do, so just keep adding oil until it won't take any more. And those sapwood diamonds are extra thirsty too. Now for the final coat, I used a mix of oil and beeswax. I love this mixture since it makes the board a little more water resistant and the beeswax smells awesome. I'll have a link to both of these in the description as well. After the wax sits for about 20 minutes, I wipe the excess off with a clean cloth and then buff them to a nice sheen. Now the designs that you can make with an ingrain board are really limitless. I love this diamond pattern, but the bow tie that I ended up happening into was really pretty slick too. And the integrated handles are gonna add a great touch that people are gonna really enjoy when you're selling these or giving these as gifts. If you wanna check out some more videos, I got some more queued up for you right there. There's also a cutting board playlist right down there. Until next time guys, Get out there and build something awesome.